Hello, my name is David Vota. I'm from North of Grumman, and I'm going to show you guys DevOps for PLM. Oh, look, this thing is blocking me. Hold on, one sorry. Okay, so a little bit about myself. I'm a software developer. Uh, I've been one for 16 years. C Sharp and Visual Studio, those are my uh, weapons of choice. I have a doctorate in computer science, DCS, and information assurance. DevOps was my main driver for research. There's a link to my dissertation, should you be inclined to go out and read it. Uh, I coined the term automation wizard. Uh, why not have fun with it? So, uh, you know, there's been some debate about what should you call yourself when you're a DevOps guy? You know, is DevOps a position? I like automation wizard. Falsely reporting agile, fragile. Um, those teams will fail to embrace the DevOps culture. DevOps is hard, and most will fail. Who said that? I said that. <laughs> uh, there's a picture of me and my family at the Del Mar Dog Beach uh, near San Diego uh, this past summer. That's a little bit about me. Moving on. These are the sections that I'm going to cover uh, the benefits culture, risk, some best practices, Azure DevOps, ASO, benefits realized, questions, and all the images and references on the slides have a link. Okay, let's start off with benefits. A major benefit of DevOps is an increased collaboration and communication that will strengthen any team. Therefore, staffing your teams with the correct stakeholders will be a critical for success. On the collaboration side, you can have diverse teams known as squads that represent stakeholders across the product. These embedded teams or squads, as you can call them, are experts in many things. Development, testing, operations, let's say a DBA, InfoSec, whatever you need, uh, those people should be on your team and you hide your squad. These are teams without boundaries. There's no more, let me check with them. You should be able to ask them directly on the call. You're gonna hold them accountable and present because they're part of the team. How many times have you heard, well, let me go check with security or mm, I'm sorry, I need a DBA for that. They should be embedded members of your team. It's important to collaborate across these teams as well as within these teams to get exposure and awareness for all potential paths of your solution. On the communication side, it's a level setter. Uh, there's no fast track to DevOps success. You have to earn your maturity through hard work and dedication. As I said on a previous slide, uh, falsely reporting agile or fragile teams will find that they're not ready for agile, let alone DevOps. So if you're not quite ready, it's okay to stop, to slow down, hop on the agile train and start down the path of agile maturity that is necessary for DevOps. A common understanding is paramount. All stakeholders, from developers, testers, operations, users, management, leadership, vendors, everyone needs to be on board. It's hard to practice Agile and Scrum, and yes, DevOps, when leadership is expecting milestones or roadmaps and metrics from some other methodology. Everyone must understand and speak in the same terms. That's the only way for success. If you're still operating in a, in a waterfall type methodology and you're expecting these milestones or these roadmaps or these very specific reports that you don't get from an agile standup, it's difficult to provide that. And some teams will spend time wasting resources trying to provide that to leadership. So leadership is paramount as well to be involved in this. Some of the benefits, part two, innovation. Resources are kind of a big deal, and dedicated resources are the kind that are necessary. You cannot have somebody wearing many hats. Somebody with a full-time job cannot simply take on more work. Something must come off the plate. Overburdened resources cannot make the time for innovation, let alone complete their daily tasks. You're going to start to see an increase in speed. Speed may appear to start out slow when picking up DevOps. There's a lot to learn but it will definitely increase and all parties need to be involved and prepared for it. 
a big conundrum is that development team is practicing DevOps. And their their you know, speed has increased drastically. Now maybe the testing team is not ready to test that frequently. The deployment team is not ready to deploy. The end users aren't ready to receive. There hasn't been training. There's lots of bottlenecks that could occur without proper awareness for the speed change that will occur. Again, starting off slow, and then it will move quite rapidly. Everyone's going to have a unique but a uniform approach. What does that mean? There's going to be similarities and synergies and commonality across all the teams, but it's not the same for everyone. We should leverage these synergies and apply them. However, again, the uniqueness is not, is not a one size shoe fits all. There's no blanket wrapping many teams and projects. Everyone starts off on a different spot with different paths that must be taken. Moving at the speed of relevance. These are both great innovations of their time, but in comparison, they're quite the opposite. How do you think these things came about? Uh, do you think that somebody planned for this innovation? Was it a need? Was it a necessity? They're innovative some solutions that solve problems. And when do you make time for innovation? The answer is you plan for it continuously. Uh, innovation should not be an accident. It should not be uh, happened by chance. You have to plan for these things. So these should be included in planning. Culture. Culture is a big one for DevOps. Uh, this is probably the biggest deal breaker for most. You gotta have an open mindset. Like the possibilities in space, there are many possibilities in DevOps. It might seem ludicrous or out of this world, we've only begun to drastically change how things are done. Embrace that change, the new technology. Failure is okay. And pioneering new things, all of these things, again, are okay to do. The mentality to fail fast and learn as you go, it's okay to fail because you'll learn. You'll learn a lot. We'll take, a, take a look at Yoda here and, and do or do not. <laughs> that was my best impression. Uh, there is no try. Um, either you did it or you did not do it. Now learn, adjust, and fix while moving on. This picture on the right here, take my money. Um, it costs a lot of money to do DevOps, to do it correctly. You have to spend time, money, resources early on and often to make this repetitive. It's not a one-stop shop where you, you kind of just invest some money and then you're done. It's continuous. You, you maybe have heard that term before. Improvement comes with a high upfront cost. So, so that's often hard to justify. You got to tell somebody, hey, it's going to take us a little bit longer to get something done, but it's going to come with higher quality and fidelity. Uh, but you're not going to see it initially, but it's just going to take longer. So I need more money, and I need more time, and I need you to be patient. That's very important for everyone to understand that this is a long-term mission. So go all in, because trying to do something is not the right attitude for disruption. DevOps will completely change the way you have done things for the better, in a big way. So there's a little caveat at the bottom here. Development and operations, that's what DevOps means. It's also known as DevSecOps, DevStarOps. DevOps has always had security and the automation of everything tightly within its grasp and context. There might be another new term coined in the future, but DevStarOps does a pretty good job of saying, Development, operations, everything in between. So just think of it as one holistic team. Let's talk about some risks. So why are we doing all this? What can DevOps help? So testing your code. You may have heard of test-driven development. You write unit-level testing. You create repeatable manual test cases, and then you eventually automate those repeatable processes for automated regression testing. You can see here things like code coverage, that's what a unit test will cover. It will cover your code. My, my best analogy for this is let's pretend your, cold, uh, your code is cold. <laughs> In this analogy here, 85% of the code has been covered with a blanket, but 15% has not been covered. So in a sense, that code has not been tested. It's cold. It needs to be tested. You strive for certain industry standards. A good standard is 80% tested code. Uh, it's hard to get 100%. It's not impossible but the flexibility and realness of getting 100% code coverage doesn't always prove fruitful. Another topic is scanning your code. So what are you scanning for? For test readiness, for code coverage, for unit test passing, for static code analysis. Static code analysis or SCA, these tools can check industry standards, best practices, and a wide variety of potential security mishaps. So at the top here, you can see we have bugs. It does scan for bugs, so things like vulnerabilities, hotspots, things that might be uh, tricky. Code smells, stinky code. 
It also checks the illities, uh, releaseability, security vulnerability, security review, reliability, maintainability. There's all there's many more complexity, coupling, nesting, for each loops. There's a lot that this tool will actively scan for, or these tools in general, SCA tools, will scan for. Lastly, secure your code. So take heed and correct any issues identified by the SCA tool. Tools like SonarQ, Coverity, FXCop, Fortify, these tools are, will scan for a variety of different things, mainly what's shown here on the slide, and they'll give you recommendations, even tips and tricks, how to fix them, what a non-compliant and a compliant solution looks like, and then you can customize that further to fit your code base or your, your type of development. However, um, you know, if you don't scan for these items, then you'll likely get missed across a wide skill level of development. All of these things can be automated, but first they had to start with a well-formed and repeatable process. This process must be cleanly spelled out. You cannot put the, the cart before the horse, no matter how much you want. Some try to skip these levels and jump right to automated regression testing. It's kind of hard to automate um, like screen clicks and mouse movements and user interaction like automated regression testing when you don't already test your code and scan your code. It's not gonna be well repeatable, it's gonna be brittle. DevOps is hard. You have to slowly level up. There's no cheat code to get you to a level 100. Uh, and these things can be stopped. So we can stop the stinky code. We can not allow it to progress out of development. So don't let it go to your other environment. Don't let it become a bug in the future. Preventing that sooner than later is very costly. Let's talk about some of these best practices. So speaking of code scanning, a code scan will help enforce standards and ensure best practices are being followed. Like many things, code can be created in a variety of ways to accomplish the same thing. They give it like any Microsoft Windows product. You can open a, a form in 10 different ways. You can write it different ways. You can close it. You can do Alt F4. There's lots of ways to do the same thing. So how do we get these things standardized to some degree? Ultimately, you want to place standards around how code is written and formed. Standards promote these strict templates and guidelines that should be enforced along with the peer review, the quality gate, and the quality profile. So these are things that a little artifact presentation of how code is being performed and how it's measuring against these cookie cutter guidelines that you have and your standards for repeatability. Do the developers know what is expected of them? Has anyone spelled it out? And oftentimes it has not been. So with these tools, you can spell it out through a pretty rigid process. Adhering to these strict standards and templates can help ensure the process is being followed. And you can even stop it using things like gates and roadblocks and failures. So again, unless you're manually scanning all the code during a peer review process, and you're an expert in every language of the code, it's likely that you could miss a nonconformity. Things to strive for, like 80% code coverage, you know, how many percentage of duplications, how many times are you copying and pasting a class? Um, instead of a shared library. You know, these are things that can be caught. Uh, some things that a junior developer might do and go back and fix, or are they writing enough unit tests? Are they covering enough code? Have they corrected their sonar cube or static code analysis issues with Coverity? These things can be repeatedly stopped at the development process. So if you define and enforce these standards across the board and don't let them continue, no exception. You know, your code doesn't make it into the deployment. Your code doesn't make it further because it's been stopped, it's been halted. A good way to do that uh, is using Azure DevOps. You can use any tool of choice. Uh, this is an example from that tool. Using something like Git or GitHub, a uh, flavor of Git of your choice, you can put things into branches and you can put them in under policy. So what does that mean exactly? A branch policy. The branch will be locked. That means that you have to submit something called a pull request, a PR, from your story branch into your main chunk. So let's think of a story, uh, a user story, typically. It's a thin slice of functionality. The story will become an artifact that marries the code to the requirement. Also accompanying that union will be testing you know, a, a pull request, continuous integration or build pipeline, and even a release build or pipeline. So the branch can be locked down. When it's locked down, it enforces that linkage, that requirement to code linkage. A peer review, how many people have to review it? Who has to review the section of code? Identify and filter on the experts of that section. It's unlikely that a single tech lead could be uh, a SME for the entire code base. You're probably gonna have a Java guy, a C guy, a Perl guy, 
whoever needs to be looking at this type of process code or workflow, they need to be identified as an improver and that can be automated. The code coverage, did you meet your code coverage? Do you have passing unit tests? Did the scan for the SEA pass? All of that is bundled into one artifact called a pull request. And this is a way to ensure that that code does not move forward until all this has been met. This purple box here, the user story branch, will not be merged into the main trunk or whichever trunk you're working out of until all of that has been completed. So that's one way to marry the first couple of slides that I was showing is putting it all together in a pull request using Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps part two. So well, there's things called build pipelines and release pipelines. Uh, they have many names. They used to be called uh, continuous integration, builds, releases, delivery. It's basically talking about the preparation for building, compiling, packaging your code, also delivering, deploying, installing, putting it somewhere. So here's your package. Where's it going? So think of like a pipeline, just like it carries water safely, cleanly, delivers water exactly where it needs to go, when it needs to go with the right approvals, the right gate pass, the right everything. So imagine, you know, when we used to have to fetch water by hand, you know, is the bucket clean? How far is the walk? What's the temperature? Is the river clean? Is the lake clean? Has the water been sanitized? Has it, did the debris fall on it from the top? So imagine it like that. It's a, a pipeline that safeguards the building and the delivery of the code. And you know you can break it down into artifacts. You know, for storing, aggregating, prepping, deploying, installing. You can do any of these things within those realms. Okay. Now imagine that with a code and a product solution. It's reality. Visually see in the pipeline the process. Where's your code at? How is it doing? You can be proactive or reactive. You can use notifications. So let me get a notice that it's my time, my turn to approve something. Oh, oh, passed approval. Now it's ready for deployment. Now it's waiting on this person. You could be proactive. And, hey, could you check that out? You know, maybe they got a notice, maybe they didn't. Um, but you can see where in the process your artifact is and where it's going and when it's complete. Um, so again, that can help you with reminders for approvals, checkpoints, and alerts. Great stuff. Benefits realized. So DevOps is definitely an enabler for increased and a continuous delivery and heightened security. Higher quality, improved testing, improved feedback, innovation, collaboration, communication. So things are great. Those are what you want, what you seek, what you sought after. So you can save time, you save resources, you save people. Happy people work harder, they work smarter, they feel valued, and again, you ultimately save money. So the quality is raised. The bar for quality is raised. People start to think, well, what else can we automate? The answer is simple. Automate everything. Well-defined and well-documented processes are potential candidates for automation. And I browse through that. I was told this was a 20 minute presentation. <laughs> so I think I may have some free time to discuss any of the things I've shown or just talk DevOps in general. So how do I answer questions here? David, um, yeah, I, there's no questions on the panel. If anyone has any questions for David, I'll feel free to ask them. David, this is uh, this is Kenny Swope. While while folks are are typing their questions into the question panel, uh, which is part of their go to webinar experience, uh, you, <laughs> you spent uh, you spent a fair amount of time talking about something that that resonates with me, and I'm wondering what what your personal experience is um, about about the rigorous sort of method needed to improve quality. So. So the use of of standard methods of coding, standard templates, standard structures of review. Um, I, I call it standard work. 
Um, many others, you know, probably use use different terms. But in your experience, um, how hard is that to get to? Well, again, it, it depends on the variety of skill set uh, mm -hmm. and how the team is operating. I, I find it's very difficult um, to land on a team that is struggling to embrace Agile, yet they're being driven to DevOps. So um, that's part of that thing I, I called fragile, <laughs> falsely reporting Agile. They're in a tool of choice that is supposed to help them practice Agile, but they don't utilize Scrum or daily stand-ups. Um, they just repurposed, you know, a chief architect to be a product owner, or they repurposed, you know, somebody to be a scrum master. They're not really trained. They're not efficient at agile, yet they're forced to walk down this broken path. Those teams are very difficult to get started. You know, they, a quick and swift answer is <laughs> make them stop and become more agile. <laughs> if, if agile has proven anything, it's that is this, you need to go agile or you'll go the way of the dinosaur. You know, you, you have to advance up that level. And only the teams that have a heightened maturity of Agile can achieve DevOps. That's why it's very hard. It's not, it's not easy. But once you have that rigid principle in, in hand of Agile, it's very easy to start applying these cookie cutter templates, these code scanning, this process for, for Git TFS flow or GitHub flow or Git flow, these standard development methodologies uh, where you can embase and ingrain those standards. So I'm kind of answering your question, Kenny, but not yeah. fully. <laughs> it's very difficult. I've, I've landed on some teams that you just said, hey, you know, we're, they're, at the, they're a heightened, agile, mature team. They're ready for the next thing. They're ready for DevOps. And those teams, it's very simple. They already write unit tests. They already create code coverage at a high level. They're very interested in automated regression testing because they have a lot of well-formed, repeatable processes. Um, those teams need help with maybe, you know, pipeline management, orchestration, selecting of tools, learning the tools, tech debt remediation. Those teams are, you know, are there's not as many as there would be, I would say, but you have to be at that heightened form. So they've been practicing Agile, in, in my opinion, for three to five years, functionally well as a team, and they're doing quite good. Those teams are like uh, low-hanging fruit, easy to take along that path. And then they say, well, I'm a manager of, you know, six teams. Can you go do it to the other five teams? And unless they're at that same level and skill uh, and agile maturity, again, is critical. It's difficult to walk them along that border, but you can start them off. There's always a starting point, right? You can say, okay, well, once you become agile, let's show me all your processes for doing work. You know, let's, let's break it out to ISO, the standardization. Show me how you know to do what you know to do. What do you do in the morning? How do you know you have to do that? Where's your process? Where's your guideline? Where's your rule? Um, and I think that's pretty critical. And ISO standardization is huge. That's not a necessity by any stretch. But as you know uh, from ISO, it's, it's great to cleanly, clearly articulate what is expected and where you're going. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, 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 and I, I resonate with your, with your comment. It's about in, in reality, as I think about DevOps and Agile, that they're actually quite rigorous. And I think there's a myth out there that that somehow they're less rigorous than perhaps other methods. But but yeah. in reality, oh. um, they're quite structured. Very, very so. That's why I like to, the level set is people don't understand that you need dedicated resources, not somebody who wears many hats doing lots of things on a full plate. Um, it's hard. It's very hard. So that's a, that's a lot of people don't understand that or realize that. So the sooner you can communicate that, that it's going to cost a lot of money. It's really hard, but the payoff is huge. Should you be successful? Great, we do have you. a question on the panel. Um, the question is, is there any uniqueness for setting up DevOps for PLM technology slash software? Can't see the question. Sorry, can you say it one more time, Juan? Uh, yeah. So, is there any, any uniqueness for setting up DevOps for TLM technologies? No, I mean, so traditionally in the past, um, I would mainly support like a Java or a C sharp program, very, um, very modern languages that rapidly support test driven development. 
Uh, but lately I've been uh, looking at programs that, that develop software uh, using C and C plus or PLM specifically. And this team is successful because they already had a Git mentality. They, they were kind of on the border of using story branches within the system of the tool and they happened to be TFS. Um, they were already quite mature and agile. They started practicing safe. They started doing things along the right track. Now they just needed help. How can we get these standards in place? And this this process, which it's very similar if you just Google like GitHub flow or Git flow, I called it Git TFS flow because <laughs> this is called TFS Azure DevOps. But um, there's, if you get a pull request system in place, that's the beginning. You'll start to see your eyes will open and you'll understand that I'm forcing a peer review I'm forcing a code validation, I'm forcing a code scan, I'm forcing who approves it. All of this can be done before code is merged back into the main trunk. So not only did I not override anyone's code, I mean, these are Git basics. I didn't override anyone's code. No one's causing a merge conflict. Uh, my code is validated, it's been tested, it's been scanned, and then I had to address those scans and failures. So I'm basically giving a quality set of code base based on my standard or my expectation. First step is to get a pull request process in place in your system, whether it be TFS, whether it be Jira, whether it be, well, probably not Jira, um, Git, GitHub, whatever whatever system you're using, Bamboo, those tools, they offer pull request policies on branches. So if, if I would say anything, as I've done this for PLM teams specifically, and they're creating this artifact, this big package that has to go off and be deployed somewhere, and it's a huge, it's not like a, a zero downtime. It's not where, you can quickly update a website and then back end database on the spot, you know, with failover and nothing's impacted. The system has to come down for several hours so this deployment can occur. And then if you get it wrong, you have to roll out, roll back and do a lot of things. So I would definitely say that this is for PLM and the best starting point would probably be a pull request process within your Git or your source control system of choice. I hope I answered your question. I couldn't see the chat though. I don't see anything. I just see. Thank you. Um, is there any more questions for David? Uh, feel free to uh, ask them in the question panel. Should I be able to see the questions? I believe you can. Maybe I'm just blind. I don't see system function, digital twin. I'm not sure if that's a question for me. I, I do have a question for you, David, given that I guess panelists are asking questions. Um, what are your thoughts on modernization technologies and DevOps, um, or where that's going? Um, there's a lot of push, uh, especially on the defense to uh, modernize software, right? You use uh, technologies like containerization, Kubernetes. Um, where do you see that going? Yeah, so you're talking about containers? Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, that's one example, but just modern, modernizing software and how DevOps could help um, do that or achieve that. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, just for containers on one or, or, or Kubernetes or whatever orchestration tool that you choose, but all of those are deeply embedded within these, these tools like Jenkins and uh, Azure DevOps and Bamboo and TeamCity. All of those have a way of moving and living. I chose not to talk about containers in this one specifically because, again, it's one of those, it's one of those things that everyone wants but is not ready for. <laughs> I find a lot of teams struggle with bracing, uh, embracing Agile. Uh, they're not ready for containerization. But when you break apart your solution into containers like that, it rapidly increases everything. So I can see um, that the government is pushing for that because we've seen it in those Iron Banks and uh, with Dr. Roper's stuff. He's got, um, it's called Iron Bank and there's another one. But it's a, a fully containerized solution that can be deployed. Like they'll give you like a DevOps factory in a box, is what they'll call it. They attach it down to you. It's basically got all the tools and all the goodies that you would need as a development team or a startup or a lab startup to go off and run and, and deliver back in the same fashion. So I don't know if that question was for me or not, but the digital twin and the, um, you know, uh, the thread, digital twin, digital thread, 
how do you get these threads and these uh, twins enabled and how do you have them be uh, actionable data? It's definitely critical. And I see containerization and this modernizing software, the way it's delivered, the way it's approached, um, the way it's managed. Because right now, you know, standing up a server to do something, yeah, it, it could be done, but you could have a dedicated server that spins up these containers, these applications on a whim. Uh, and just like infrastructure as code, which I also did in broach, it's one of my favorite topics, um, is you can completely stand up and destroy labs in a heartbeat you know, using infrastructure as code, using stuff like CodeStream and Code, uh, not CodeStream, and CodeStream, and the Realize Orchestrator, but everything's moving to the cloud. So I think the cloud has kind of been disrupting some of that stuff, but uh, I've tinkered around with some of the AWS stuff. That stuff looks pretty pretty powerful. Uh, the command line interface that you can use to, get to, to mimic the infrastructure as code, similar to, you know, a lot of these tools don't be nice, you know, like CodeStream, VMware, Amazon. I know they're supposed to be like vanilla or standard. Right? There's so many systems out there now. They all want you to learn their own proprietary software, this low code, no code stuff. I don't, I don't particularly like low code, no code because it's, it's very proprietary and it's not low code, no code. Somebody has to take hours of training to learn how to write in this proprietary language. But, but you're on the right track. One, I mean, I, you especially know exactly how powerful containers and these factories in a box can be. So I would definitely do to embrace that. But I think there's very few that can achieve that realization right now. Um, that's very high on the maturity scale. It's level 90, you know, before you get to level 100. Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, is there any more questions from the audience or any anything further you want to discuss, uh, David? No, that's it. If you have any questions, let me know. All the links were in the last page. They're all basically uh, open, free resources. Um, and again, this will be published. If you have any questions, reach out. Let me know. I don't have anything else to share. All right. Thank you, David. Um, our next presenter.